nine is two minutes and 30 seconds now. Two minutes mark from wide nine. On June 20th, 2004, I came to Mojave, California with some friends to witness the first civilian space flight. As I watch the planes paint white lines in the sky, my mind wanders back to the early 1960s when the United States sent Alan Shepard and John Glenn into space. I was in high school then, but what I am seeing above me today brings back the same feelings that I had when the original astronauts went up. The big difference now is that this flight is 100% civilian, and unlike the NASA space flights, this one will open the door for ordinary people to go into space. I want to share with you what my friends and I experienced as we watched Bert Rattan and his team send the first civilian into space, and in the process capture the coveted X Prize. The launch is just seconds away. But I'm starting the story at the end. Maybe I'd better back up and show you how we got to this point. Okay, I got one yellow and I've got two yellows. I invite you to settle back in your chair and let us give you an up close and personal look at how it happened. Three, two, one, ready. Release. Release. The story starts in Mojave, California, an isolated town nestled in the desert of the same name. When you come into Mojave from the west, you see hundreds of windmills generating electrical power. They dominate many of the hills in the area, and at times it seems there are more windmills here than people. As you approach the airport, you cannot help but notice the rows of airplanes lined up beyond the runways. Acres of jumbo jets and a host of other aircraft from the past are mothballed here, a testament to the dry desert climate that makes it a perfect place for long-term aircraft storage. The Mojave Airport is the premier civilian flight test center for some of the most unique and exotic aircraft ever built, including Voyager, the Global Flyer, Proteus, and now Spaceship One. Clearly there are many neat things to see on the airport, but according to my stomach, the best place to start is at the Voyager restaurant, named after the record-setting airplane designed by Burt Rattan and flown non-stop around the world in 1986 by Gina Yeager and Burt's brother Dick Rattan. It is not hard to imagine that some of the most famous pilots in the world have had a meal at the Voyager restaurant. The list would no doubt read like the who's who of aviation. Even famous billionaires like Sir Richard Branson sometimes eat here. But today we have little time to hobnob with the rich and famous. The sun is coming up and it's time to start thinking about the events that will soon unfold. Leaving the restaurant, we made a navigational error and turned left instead of right. This put us on the flight line, where to our surprise, we encountered the spacecraft sitting outside the hangar. We never expected to get close to Spaceship One, but fate had just changed that. Suddenly, we were standing side by side with the crew as they prepared Spaceship One for its history-making flight. Not long after we arrive, other people also wander into the area. The local radio station announced that several thousand people were expected to witness the event, far different from the scene at the historic flight of the Wright brothers. I must confess that even though we looked, we never actually saw the enormous crowd gathered on the other side of the airport. That was okay because we were extremely happy to be with the spaceship. This is it. For a while, none of the crew paid much attention to us, so we just hung out at the rocket, snapping pictures and taking video. Finally, someone asked if we had the proper badge to be there. At that point, we confessed that we were lost, but instead of asking us to hit the road, these nice folks simply asked us to please step back and give them some room to work. We were happy to comply and moved about 100 feet away. As it turned out, that was a perfect distance for photographs and video. 
Day kept the video camera rolling while the crew prepared Spaceship One for its journey into space. And that is why you are seeing these magnificent pictures. Bert Rattan, the innovative aeronautical engineer responsible for some of the most esoteric aircraft of the last quarter century, designed Spaceship One to travel in near space in a short suborbital flight, then glide back to Earth and land as an airplane. Sounds simple enough, but going into space, even near space, presents challenges beyond what is typically experienced by traditional aircraft. So the flight today could still be a real nail-biter. Bert assembled a Blue Ribbon crew of engineers, technicians, and pilots, but he is a hands-on manager that keeps involved with all phases of the operation. His continued guidance is ever-present as Spaceship One prepares to go into space for the first time. A spacecraft goes into space propelled by a rocket engine, but it takes money as well. Paul G. Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, believed in the Spaceship One project so much, he invested $20 million to help make sure that the dream of civilian space travel becomes a reality. This is outstanding, but even if you have the money to invest, there is still an enormous risk associated with investing in unproven technology. I feel we all owe Paul our gratitude for his generosity and commitment in helping to open up space travel for the rest of us. The crew connects the high-pressure air hoses to start the engines of White Knight, and the unmistakable sound of jet engines fills the air. Some crew members head to Mission Control, where they will man computer consoles that display real-time data during the flight. The chase planes start their engines and we feel the excitement build as the crew scrambles to remove the remaining pieces of support equipment and unplug the lines. Spaceship One with 63-year-old Mike Melville inside is suspended below White Knight. The engineering, the innovation, and the training are now complete. Once Spaceship One is set free from White Knight, Mike Melville will be in command of the world's first civilian spacecraft. The chalks are pulled and the moment that we have awaited is at hand. We have no idea what will happen above us today and the air is heavy with anticipation. Everyone seems a bit anxious, but no matter what the outcome, it is clear that Bert Rattan and company have created something very special. Brian Binney increases power to the twin jet engines of White Knight and releases the brakes. The journey to the runway and the flight into the history books has now begun. As Spaceship One taxis for takeoff, it is worth noting that even after experiencing some delays, Spaceship One went from concept to reality in record time. It is now preparing to go into space with far less testing than any previous spacecraft. Spaceship One and its mothership, White Knight, will not go aloft alone. They will be in the company of three chase planes. One of the chase planes is a Burt Rattan design called a Starship. Scaled Composites teamed up with the Beechcraft Corporation to produce over 50 of these unique aircraft. Today, the Starship will accompany White Knight to about 41,000 feet. A two-place aerobatic sport plane called the Extra 300 is the low-altitude chase. It will guide Spaceship One to a safe touchdown and occasionally emit a smoke trail so spectators and cameras can find Spaceship One in the cloudless blue sky. A sleek-looking French-German military aircraft called the Alpha Jet will accompany White Knight to the launch altitude. 
Spaceship One and the chase planes taxi past a sea of spectators gathered near the taxiway, giving everyone an up-close and personal look at all the air machines involved in today's historic flight. It will take almost an hour for White Knight to carry Spaceship One to the launch altitude of nearly 50,000 feet. While White Knight maneuvers into position for the drop, our excitement level remains high as we listen to the chatter coming from the aircraft radios. Because the launch is in the direction of the sun, everyone is looking skyward with arms outstretched trying to block the glare. We have suddenly become a strange human species with limbs that grow upward toward the sun. White Knight reaches the launch point and releases Spaceship One. As soon as the two craft are clear of each other, Mike fires the rocket engine. Within seconds, Spaceship One is heading straight up at Mach 3. But because the launch is in the direction of the sun, it is hard to see and even harder to photograph. We lose the launch in the sun, but capture the smoke trail from the engine of Spaceship One as it rockets upward. A nearby handheld radio allows us to hear live communications between Spaceship One and the Mission Control Center as TV cameras with large telescopic lenses catch the action. About 20 minutes after the launch, we hear the telltale sonic boom that signals Spaceship One is coming home. Soon the chase planes and Earth's newest spacecraft are back in view. If Spaceship One makes a good landing, then not only has it made history, it has made going into space look effortless. Chuck Coleman in the Extra 300 guides Spaceship One all the way to the runway. We do not see the touchdown, but the chase planes are landing on the same runway, so we presume that everything went well. The sleek Alpha Jet makes a nice landing in front of us, and the Extra 300 is not far behind. We are standing at the perfect place to be up close and personal with the returning aircraft. The Starship, owned and piloted by Robert Shearer, lands after the Extra 300. Last night, Danny spoke with Robert at the hotel, and as a remembrance of the historic event, he promised Danny an autograph. Our attention is on the starship when suddenly White Knight makes a victory pass close to the ground. It passes in silence as if it were a glider, then with a roar befitting a twin-engine jet, climbs like a homesick angel to enter the landing pattern. The skill of the pilots associated with scaled composites is clearly apparent as we watch White Knight make a butter-smooth landing. I love the unconventional look of this aircraft. To me, it looks like a praying mantis with turbojets. On the way back to the hangar, White Knight taxis past us. Everyone is cheering and waving at the crew that carried Spaceship One on the first part of its journey into space. This is a great example of the American can-do spirit, and we are filled with pride as White Knight goes by. Just when I thought the event could not get any better, it does. I turn around and here comes Spaceship One in tow behind the recovery truck, bound for a happy homecoming at the Scaled Composites hangar. If we were any closer to history, it would run us over. When Spaceship One arrives in front of the hangar, wild cheers and applause for Mike Melville come from the many people who work to make this day a reality. I am filled with pride just watching it happen. The people responsible for making it happen must feel an incredible sense of accomplishment. We want to go over to congratulate Mike and the rest of the folks that just made history. But suddenly, a contingent of uniform security materialized to block off access to the area. All we can do now is look on as the history-making rocket plane goes back into the hangar. Exactly the same way I used to put away my Cessna after a flight. I never imagined I'd live to see a spaceship handled like a private plane.
We may not have access to the hangar, but we have the next best thing when Robert Shearer secures the Starship and comes over to talk with us. It's NC-51 right there, 51 out of 53 no, Starships built. How far did you go up with the uh, launch? Uh, we were up around 41,000 feet. And where did they launch at? And it, they didn't seem to be a whole lot higher. You know, usually they're up around 48. And it looks like they were lower today. Did they achieve the, the final altitude? You know, I've heard a rumor that they, they hit 328 and chain. Oh, that's all so, they needed was 328. Well, right? yeah, but that's not official. They're, they're waiting for confirmation, I think, from Edwards. Edwards has got the altitude reading uh, radar, right? But it's, it's close. If they, if they just missed it, they've got the high altitude airplane record. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> they've got the X-15 beat there. So do you work wow. with the, uh, the, 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 the company? I, I don't work for them. I just provide the Starship and uh, am very lucky to be here doing that, that's for sure. Where are you based out of? Out of Orange County, California. Oh, all right. Santa Ana. And what's your name again? Robert Shearer. Robert Shearer, okay. That's yeah. C-H-E-R-E-R. -E -E well, this guy here wants your autograph. He thinks you're a great guy. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Robert makes good his promise of an autograph for Danny, oh, yeah, then takes us by surprise and invites us aboard the Starship for an up-close and personal wow. look at the unique aircraft. The Starship is luxurious inside. Richard and Danny check it out as if they are prospective buyers. When I enter the cockpit, I instantly understand one of the reasons why this aircraft is so special. It has a space-age instrument panel called an all-glass cockpit. In this case, the term all-glass means that the instrument panel is a maze of computer screens that replace the traditional circular analog dials and gauges. The tour of the Starship is a great way to end our day at the Mojave Airport, and we thank Robert for the opportunity to come aboard. We vow to return to Mojave in September, when Spaceship One will go aloft again for the first of two flights required to win the $10 million X Prize. In Mojave, space flights are not just about rocket ships. Here it seems that one cannot launch a spacecraft without a party the night before. I love the parties, but getting up before dawn is not as much fun. In the early morning darkness, Mike Melville dresses for his historic flight, while outside, a dozen or more people attend to the spacecraft. No store. We follow crew chief Steve Losey as he methodically pre-flights Spaceship One. It's right there in front of that car. Making sure that everything's destructionally intact. We're looking for free play in that system. Of course, before one embarks on a voyage, especially a trip into space, hugs and handshakes are the first order of business. Mike accepts wishes for success from the group of friends and family on hand to celebrate this historic day with him. He is a skilled pilot with years of flight test experience, so it is likely that the flight today will be a walk in the park. But just in case it is not, Mike is clearly the right man to tame Spaceship One and bring it home safely. Mike finishes saying his goodbyes, then walks to Spaceship One with his wife, Sally. She has come this far with him, so it's only fitting that she walk with him right to the entry hatch. I'll bet that if it were possible, she would go all the way into space with him. While Mike dons his parachute, a steady stream of rocket fans pour into the Mojave Airport. Most come by car, while some arrive by private plane. But no matter the mode of transportation, they come by the thousands to witness history in the making. I watch Mike put on his parachute, and it occurs to me that a craft not much bigger than an SUV is about to go into space with a human being aboard. Mike is dressed in a traditional flight suit, not a spacesuit. Of course, he will wear an oxygen mask and helmet, but no fancy pressure suit for Mr. Melville. This is encouraging because even though he is going over 60 miles high, there is apparently no need for him to dress up like a spaceman. To me, the implication is clear. 
when you and I get the chance to fly into space, it will be similar to flying in an airliner. I just hope that I get two bags of peanuts on my flight. The press corps is up before the sun to file their stories with the media outlets on the East Coast. It is going on 9 o'clock there, so stories are filed from California before sunup. To help everyone get moving, the XPRIZE staff has graciously provided coffee and breakfast in the press room. What happens here today will be seen live in many parts of the world. Special trucks designed to beam coverage of the event to orbiting satellites are already in place. And local TV and radio crews stand by to transmit their signals to nearby mountaintops. I am not a morning person, but today I am wide awake long before the sun pops up. I drop Dag at the VIP area, then in the dark I search for a place to park the car. When I return, he verifies that the camera is ready to capture the events of the day, so we hang out and look forward to the sunrise. The sun makes a dramatic appearance over the mountains to the east, providing a stunning backdrop for the thousands of cameras waiting to record the event. Within minutes of the sunrise, White Knight, with Spaceship One slung below, emerges from behind the crowd and taxis past us. The cheers and applause for Mike Melville are lost in the sound coming from the powerful jet engines. The Starship and the Extra 300 follow White Knight to the runway. After takeoff, they will position themselves for the launch. It is not long before we see vapor trails appear above us, so we know that the launch is drawing near. The vapor trails, also called contrails or simply cons, make White Knight and the chase planes visible as they fly toward a place in the sky known as the launch box. It should take White Knight just under an hour to reach the drop altitude of about 50,000 feet, so we have time to explore the area. There is much to see at the Mojave Airport, so while White Knight climbs to 50,000 feet, we look around. Suddenly, we look up and there's Spaceship One underway. We miss capturing the actual launch, but catch a nice shot of Spaceship One under rocket power. Normally, pictures of a white line in a blue sky are not so dramatic. But what we see here today is more than dramatic. It is historic. Spaceship One has an engine that burns a mixture of nitrous oxide and ground-up rubber. This unique rocket fuel provides sufficient thrust to propel Spaceship One to Mach 3. Nitrous oxide, commonly known as laughing gas, is much safer to handle than traditional rocket fuels. Usually a fuel spill is not a laughing matter. But with nitrous oxide, I suppose it could be. Yeah, want to hit? All of the pilots involved in today's historic event play a significant part. But because Spaceship One has limited visibility, it is up to Chuck Coleman in the Extra 300 to guide it safely to the runway. What Bird and his associates at Scaled Composites accomplished today is so great that even after witnessing the event, some people may still have a hard time grasping the magnitude of the achievement. It is on a par with the history-making flight of the Wright brothers that spawned the aviation industry. History will no doubt record that the men and women who worked to make today's flight possible opened the door to civilian space travel. When Spaceship One arrives in front of us, Mike Melville is already standing on top of the famous craft. Someone hands him a microphone and he holds an impromptu press conference. Uh, I've been very, very lucky to get a, a third shot at this. And, uh, you know, I just can't describe what it looks like up there. You know, this time I managed to get it upside down at the top so I could really look down. And I had a little bit of roll rate going and I took a few pictures with a still camera out of the windows. And uh, so we got the black sky, the horizon, and the ground. And it was, a, it was a spectacular thing to see. You, you really cannot describe what it looked like. 
It was very exciting. Um, I just loved every second of it. <laughs> Maybe I'm crazy. I did a victory roll at the very top, and then I did another one coming in here at about 23,000 feet. The rocket ran like a dream. I didn't let it run its full cycle this time because we had clearly made the altitude, so I shut it down 11 seconds early. It could have gone a lot higher. We probably could have made 350 or 360,000 feet if I'd let it run. Right, right. We gotta preserve it and make sure it's good to go. And I've looked at it, and I think we just change out the engine and fill it with gas and go again. No, I think, uh, I don't think I'll be flying the next flight. Um, you know, I'm too old to be doing this. <laughs> what happened in the roll? Well, uh, did, could you see it in the, in the uh, contrail? Yeah. Yeah, right at the top, uh, right at the top as, I, as the engine was about to shut down, I got it into a rolling motion, but I wasn't worried about it. The rates were pretty good. Uh, and it sailed on up just straight as a die, so I'm very happy with how it worked out. And a victory roll at the top of the climb is important for an air show pilot. <laughs> did I plan the roll? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to say I did, but I didn't. It was, uh, you know, you're extremely busy at that point. Your feet and your hands and your eyes and everything is working about as fast as you can work them. And uh, probably I stepped on something too quickly and caused the roll. But, uh, it's nice to do a roll at the top of the climb. What was that? What did I do? <laughs> when I got to the top, I got all the rates stopped and got it set that set straight. And then I took my little camera and took a few pictures out of the windows. No, I didn't do the M and M's this time. I was too busy with the camera. I was very, very pleased with how the vehicle behaved. It was absolutely perfect. No, there were no problems at all today. This was a, a near perfect flight as far as I could see. From my point of view, it was a perfect flight. Thanks, Pete. Hey, thanks, Doug. Mike, John. Hey, Frank, great engine, man. That engine would have gone 11 more seconds. How high would that have been? <laughs> Yeah, if you look up long enough, your eyes will dilate enough to see them. But uh, you can see planets, but not stars immediately, because your eyes are very contracted from the bright light. The extra weight was great. It was a, a little softer start, because with the same thrust as last time, it's not such a hard hit on your back. Either that or I'm getting used to it. But it seemed like a softer start, and then great acceleration. A real smooth ride till I got uh, about 160,000 feet. Then it gets a little bit rough as the engine runs through, a little roughness. And then the engine shuts down and it's real smooth, real quiet, and a beautiful, beautiful view. After his press conference, Mike moves on to share the account of his flight with more of the crowd. As he departs, someone from the Today Show pleads with him to appear on their show. Hey Mike, you want to join us on the Today Show tomorrow? <laughs> The X Prize was inspired by the Ortigue Prize of 1919. It offered $25,000 to the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, we know that in 1927, Charles Lindbergh won that one. To win the X Prize, one must build a spacecraft capable of carrying a pilot and two passengers, or a pilot and the equivalent weight of two people to an altitude of at least 328,000 feet on two separate flights within a 14-day period. My friends and I came to Mojave three times to watch the American Mojave Aerospace Ventures team from Scaled Composites attempt to capture the X Prize. On each occasion, we met many wonderful people and learned something about the other companies creating craft that might someday play a role in civilian space travel. One prominent company at the Mojave Airport is x -Core. They created a rocket-powered craft called the Easy Rocket, based on Burt Rattan's kid airplane called the Long Easy. 
However, the Easy Rocket is a long easy on steroids. It is an excellent blending of existing technology with innovative ideas. There is a true spirit of cooperation at the Mojave Airport. That was evident when on the eve of the monumental journey of his Spaceship One, Burt Rattan dropped by the x -Corps facility. He hung out and shared his views on aircraft and spacecraft design, functioning as the CEO of a rapidly burgeoning enterprise, life at the Mojave Airport, and of course, the pursuit of the X Prize. Everyone listened carefully to Bert, and we all came away with a better understanding of the important issues. In the end, I had but one question. When Spaceship One flies tomorrow, will Mike Melville be the only biological entity aboard? I realize I may never know the answer to that question. Rocket scientists and engineers are people too, and just like everyone else, they enjoy having fun. Each evening before the flight of Spaceship One, there were parties and other fun activities around Mojave. x always had a great party that featured good food and refreshments. On one occasion, they even had a real spaceman. Okay, he could have been an actor in a rented spacesuit, but it was still fun and a good time was had by all. Nobody got rowdy, but someone did get carried away. Each time we visit x -Corps, Doug Jones, one of the founders, treats us to a demonstration of their T-Cart engine. It is a small rocket engine, but still quite impressive. Dan DeLong, hey another x -Corps founder, joins Doug outside, and together they put on an impressive show. I wonder if one of these engines would fit on a motorbike, or maybe even my bicycle. On one occasion, a high-quality telescope was set up outside the x -Corps hangar. It was there so that those of us who did not have a ticket on Spaceship One would still have the opportunity to get a closer look at the planets. Rockets and planets are very interesting, but to really party, one needs dance music and flashing lights. A friend of mine named Dejer is an X-Prize official and a musician. He helped arrange a fun party the night before the first launch. As you know, Mojave is in California, and Californians really know how to party. At least one band was scheduled to play for us, but 40 mile an hour winds sweeping across the desert that night prevented them from setting up. At times, the wind gusts were so strong, just staying on our feet was a major accomplishment. But strong winds could not stop the show. Thanks to pre-recorded music, flashing lights, and a DJ in an electric suit, it was party time well past midnight. As the darkness turns to light, I see familiar faces in the large crowd that has gathered once again to witness history in the making. We wave and cheer at the chase planes as they taxi past us. No matter how often I see the starship, I'm always thrilled by the sleek, innovative design. Suddenly, White Knight with Spaceship One slung below emerges from behind the crowd and taxis past us. Once again, the cheers and applause from the crowd are lost in the noise from the powerful jet engines of White Knight as it taxis past.
right, now we'll give you your six feet. It has been a week since Mike Melville successfully completed the first of two flights required to win the X Prize. Today, Brian Binney is at the controls of Spaceship One for the second and final flight necessary to win the X Prize. If everything goes as planned, the entry from scaled composites known as the American Mojave Aerospace Ventures Team will win the coveted X Prize. The departure of White Knight now seems commonplace, but behind the scenes, a lot of coordination is taking place between mission control and the various aircraft involved in the launch. The chase planes play an important role in the mission and they demonstrate top-notch flying to the crowd as they follow White Knight into the blue Mojave sky. Just north of the sun position. If you look above that, you'll see the contrails. You can look out and see them with your naked eye right now. You see them in series. The two low chase and high chase making the marks. You see the cons? One fist, block out the sun at arm's length. Two fist lengths to the left, you see dual contrails inbound. You'll see a separation and a third con will develop. Got it, Dag? See it? The high chase now is getting as close as they can for the photo op. That's one minute, folks, one minute from release. White Knight is two minutes and 30 seconds out. Okay, we just got a call from the cockpit, two minutes, two minutes out. Now, folks, you will not hear the sonic boom from the ascent, but you will hear the double boom from the descent. Two minutes is marked. A third two-minute warning comes from the loudspeakers, and we find it humorous. But we get serious when a one-minute call ratchets up the excitement, and we focus on the contrails. Okay, folks, this is your third two-minute call. <laughs> one minute, one minute. <laughs> Go for release. Here come uh, forward elbow on, I'll probably push your nose down. The motion guards are up. Much Leaders better. Are on. Okay, I got one yellow, and I've got two yellows. Okay, what you're watching now on your screens at home is actual footage of White Knight and Spaceship One, 30 seconds. Twenty seconds. Twenty seconds is what I was just Ten seconds, ready, Matt? Stand by. Ten seconds. Three, two, one, release. 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 Good release. Good release. You see the separate con. The rocket motor's going. There it goes, folks. Go, Brian, go. White Knight releases Spaceship One then turns away as Brian Binney lights the candle. This time, the smoke from the rocket engine and the contrails make a great visual for the thousands of cameras recording the event. Thirty seconds. Okay, 40 seconds, the energy's on the line, the trajectory looks good. But it looks like he's caught it. 40 seconds, energy's good. 
100,000 feet. One minute thirty. Three hundred thousand. Three twenty-eight. Radar three twenty-eight. One seventy. Twenty seconds to go. Two hundred thousand feet. They're shut down. Right now he's Mach 3 in the climb. When the smoke stops, we lose sight of Spaceship One. Only radar scopes and telescopes can see it now. But the announcers tell us that it is traveling straight up at Mach 3. Brian, sounds great. Systems are green. 84 seconds. Whatever I'm talking about, shut down. The weather is green. 84 second burn. Shutdown was clean. Systems are green. Copy that, Brian. It's moving in the screen. 300,000. Okay, we just shut the feather all the way up now. It is green. Feathers up. 328,000 feet. Still climbing. We know that it'll be about 20 minutes before Spaceship One will once again be low enough to see. But this time we want to photograph the return so we keep our eyes glued to the sky. There you go. And now we're cross checking your data now, Brian. The, uh, the radar does cross check pretty good the kinematic altitude. Ladies and gentlemen, from the south in the final turn overhead, Spaceship One in trail by the extra marking with smoke, the Alpha Jet on the west, and the Starship on the right. Spaceship One appears overhead in the company of the chase planes. It looks just like an airplane because right now it is. Well, strictly speaking, it's a glider. What a concept. A glider that can fly at three times the speed of sound. Hey Bert, I have a license to fly a glider. Would you let me take Spaceship One for a little spin? Maybe not. On its final approach. Spaceship One on final approach. He'll be chased to the ground by the extra. We'll be calling out his altitude because he loses visibility to see out the front in a flare. We'll just let it speak for itself here, folks. Spaceship One makes a picture-perfect landing and the recovery vehicles race out to meet it. The three chase planes, the Starship, the Alpha Jet, and the Extra 300 treat us to a dramatic formation flyby. As soon as the chase planes are clear, White Knight makes its trademark pass overhead. Clearly, everyone loves watching this unique air machine fly. We are delighted to be so close as it lands directly in front of us. Once again, Spaceship One is towed to where a sea of humanity is waiting to greet the triumphant spaceman. Brian Binney made going into space look just as easy as Mike Melville had on his two flights. And in the process, he set a new altitude record for an airplane of 367,442 feet. In case your calculator is not handy, that translates to 69.6 miles, 
beating the previous record of 67 miles held by Joseph Walker in the NASA X-15. Spaceship One arrives at the VIP area, where Dr. Peter H. Diamandis, the chairman and founder of the XPRIZE Foundation, introduces Bert Rattan and the other key participants to the crowd. If I could uh, please invite onto the stage Bert Rattan, the designer of the first private spaceship, Spaceship One. Bert. Welcome, Paul Allen. The visionary billionaire who made it possible. Paul. Brian. Brian Binney, the pilot of Spaceship One, X2. Sir Richard Branson. Richard. I'd like to also invite onto the stage the administrator of the FAA, Marion Blakey. Marion. Congratulations. Welcome. This is a big moment. It is. Up. The Associate Administrator, Patty Gray Smith. I, I also would like to invite Anush and Amir Ansari, please, to come up. Our title sponsors who have made this day possible. Anusha. Amir. Folks, uh, allow me to first turn over the mic to Bert Rutan. Bert. After the introductions, Dr. Diamandis conducts a short ceremony to acknowledge the winning of the X Prize. On behalf of his team, Bert accepts congratulations for a job well done. Then the official entourage moves over to the press area for another ceremony. Our pleasure. Let's get the champagne here ready. Let's invite on the stage Paul Allen, Bert Rutan, Brian Biddy, Mike Melville. Where are you, Mike? Is Mike here? Can we get Mike down to the end over here? Is he still here? And Richard. Ladies and gentlemen, for 40 years we have watched the spaceships have flown and crowds of people have moved five miles away when a few lone astronauts have got on board and ignited those engines. Today, the spaceship has landed and stands not five miles away, but five feet away. We're at the birth of a new era, the personal spaceflight revolution. And it is our pleasure to announce today in Mojave, California, that Spaceship One has made two flights to 100 kilometers and has won the Ansari X Prize. I think we all got some champagne here today. Um, <laughs> refreshingly <laughs> busy. Um, you know, Bert, we're still giving you a $10 million check here. Well, sorry to keep you waiting. Mr. Allen has funded every, every penny that went into the development of the space, spaceship. Uh, it's totally funded by, by Paul Allen. And uh, I'm working with my board so that I can share our share of that with every one of my employees at scale. Thanks, Bert. Well, I, I guess I just have to say this is uh, one of the most gratifying, rewarding things I've ever been part of, and and I just my hat, uh, my hat, uh, my spaceship one hat, I guess, is just is off to, to Bert, and it's incredible. This is an incredible technical achievement. I guess I've said it before, but I'll say it again. If you look at all the systems uh, that had to work perfectly and the skill of the pilots involved in these different flights, every flight basically has has been an improvement, has gone better, has gone higher. Uh, 
We had another record-breaking breaking flight today on top of winning the X Prize. I mean, it's just amazing and rewarding. And but it's not just the tech, just not, not just the fact that, you know you you break a record or win the X Prize. I think the the soul of adventure that lives in these kinds of endeavors, the the, the enthusiasm of the people that work on it, just it's, it's hard to explain. But I hope you've got a sense for that that today, and that's what makes all these things worthwhile. When it is Paul Allen's turn to speak, he is rudely interrupted when a vintage F4 Phantom jet lights the afterburners and roars down the runway. Uh, when I went to you guys five years ago to fund the X Prize, um, well, I guess we get the best of both worlds. We got the I'm Sorry family to fund the prize, and you ended up funding the, uh, the team. So without you, this would not be possible. Thank you. Um, in 1901, Wilbur Wright wrote the following. He said, if you're looking for perfect safety, you'll do well to sit on a fence and watch the birds. But if you really wish to learn to fly, you must mount the machine and become acquainted with its tricks and actual trials. Until now, Mike Melville has been the center of attention. But today is Brian Binney's well-deserved day in the spotlight. He did a flawless job of taking Spaceship One to a record altitude and bringing it home safely. Listening to Brian talk about the project gives us further insight into why Scaled Composites was successful in capturing the X Prize. I've been involved in a lot of flight test programs uh, over the last 15, 20 years, and there's certainly been none that equal the, uh, the, the magnitude, the reach that this one has had. Um, you think about this, this vehicle has uh, flown six powered flights. What most programs, um, when they're starting out, after about the fifth or sixth flight, they're, they're off the runway and they're, they're now thinking about racing the landing gear. Well, six flights in this vehicle, three of them have been to space. And, and that's really amazing in anybody's uh, book. Uh, when we planned out this program, um, Bert kind of pulled us and said, well, you know, what do we think the test program should look like? And we're all huddled around and we're saying, well, you know, let's make the first flight about this big. And um, Bert looks at that and goes, no way, we're first flight, we're way up there. And, and we did, you know, we, we kind of scoffed at um, transonics and said, we're not going to mess with that, we're just going to go right through it. We don't want to live there, we want to get what's beyond there. And the first flight, that's what we did. And it's, uh, we've never looked back, and it's been to the credit, the insight, and the spirit of Bert Rattan that we're here today. And um, I've never seen anything like it, I've never been part of anything like it. And I tell you, it's a thrill of a lifetime. It's been one heck of a roller coaster the last uh, two and a half years, three years. And uh, today is a fantastic culmination of a uh, huge amount of hard work on a lot of people's part. But again, the, the, the core team is about 20 people. And to think that 20, 30 people built two airplanes, tested the rocket motor, developed it, integrated it, put the avionics in, decided on a flight test program, executed it, and here we are today. And uh, Bert, your leadership has been just outstanding. Thank you. You know, to all the children out there, this is what you get when you follow your dreams and you don't let those older people who tell you how it can't be done stop you. Because if, uh, if, if Bert or anybody here had followed in the footsteps of the traditional aerospace industry, we'd still be on the ground. This is all about taking risk, allowing for breakthroughs, and going after your dreams. Uh, we'll be announcing later today the XPRIZE Cup a, a, uh, a multi-million dollar race that will happen every year in New Mexico. We'll be inviting all of the other 25 teams who are looking at you proud. I think today, Bert, you brought a rising tide that will bring billions of dollars into this industry and will help fund other teams to go into the stars. We'll be inviting all the teams to compete. And, uh, and, and Richard, I hope that uh, I might come up and say a few words, but that Virgin Galactic will uh, we'll join us in the X-Prize Cup and fly some of your ships at that time. Thank you. Um, well, just want to say uh, once again, congratulations uh, to Paul uh, for his vision and Bert for his technical, uh, uh, technical supremacy in making today possible, and for the whole team of the X-Prize for spurring everybody on. Um, yeah, in, in three years' time, Bert has promised to deliver 
uh, five spacecraft, uh, five uh, seated spacecraft, and two, uh, two Virgin Galactic Airways to take people into space. Um, and a little later on today, Bert and I are going to have a press conference to discuss the future with you. Um, but right now, I just want to say congratulations. Thank you. By the way, Brian brought this flag with him on Spaceship One up to 368,000 feet today. Um, and if, uh, if Bert hadn't mentioned it, today was in the record books exceeding the X-15 by 13,000 feet. We were concerned, will he make it? Can we call it? You blew it away, 328,000 feet plus. Civilian space travel is inevitable. But I believe that by creating the X Prize, Dr. Peter Diamandis helped to significantly accelerate the timeline. The X Prize, officially known as the Ansari X Prize, is just the first step in the quest for civilian space travel. To further motivate all the companies building privately funded spacecraft, a new incentive called the X Prize Cup is now underway in Las Cruces, New Mexico. But at least three companies located at the Mojave Airport are still directly involved in the race for civilian space. So the magic from Mojave will keep on coming. The future of civilian space travel is still unknown. But if we dare to dream, we have it in our power to make our dreams come true. Bert Rattan, Mike Melville, Brian Binney, Paul Allen, and the many other people that worked to send Spaceship One on its flight had a dream to open up space travel for civilians. They did something that even powerful, well-funded governments have failed to do. They had the courage to follow their dream, even when some were saying they were not likely to succeed. But succeed they did. And what they accomplished is the genesis of a new industry that will no doubt benefit all humankind. Sir Richard Branson, founder of Virgin Atlantic Airways and the new space initiative Virgin Galactic, is developing a fleet of five passenger spacecraft. If he stays on schedule, some of us will make it into space. Spaceship One, won't you please take 